Hi, everybody. We'll just wait for a few more people to join before we get started. Uh, people are still joining, so I'm going to wait probably another minute or so before we get started. Great, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Rewards of Nature Restoration webinar. Uh, I am Martin Harper. I'm the Regional Director for BirdLife in Europe and Central Asia, and I'm going to chair today's event. Uh, thanks so much for joining, uh, and thanks also to the joint sponsors, the Endangered Landscapes Programme and UNEP WCMC. Uh, so you know, this event is being recorded. Uh, and you should also know that the chat bar is not in operation today. Um, however, you can comment online using the hashtag uh, restore nature, all one word, uh, and you will be able to ask questions later on by you in using the question and answer function. That's the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen in the center. And we'll be able to come back to that later. Um, before I start, um, before we get started, um, I really do need to say a few words about the war in Ukraine. Over the past three months, BirdLife has been supporting our partner in Ukraine, uh, USPB, uh, in supporting a major restoration project for um, remaining parts of the Eurasian steppe south of Kherson on the edge of the Black Sea. And this project would have provided huge benefits to wildlife, including the sandy mole rat, which is actually endemic, particularly to that region of Ukraine, and but also benefits to people. It would also have continued the great track record of conservation that our part, the USPB, has delivered over the past 28 years. Yet today, the project area is covered in Russian tanks, and the USPB staff are either sheltering in Ukraine, trying to leave, or have already left and are now refugees. It's a catastrophe for Ukrainian people and also for Ukrainian nature. My organization, BirdLife, said publicly to have any chance of tackling the nature and climate emergency, we need peaceful cooperation that thrives on diversity, the rule of law, a healthy society, and a free press. And all of this is now at stake. And it's why we stand with Ukraine and we really urge the Russian leaders to stop the war. The, the conservation community is currently doing whatever it can to support our Ukrainian friends and colleagues. And of course, we look forward to the day when we can support USPB rebuild itself and restore the magnificent landscapes across Ukraine, including its steppe grasslands. Because that is our challenge. We want and need our continent to be leading the world in restoration. We have the responsibility because so much of our nature has been affected by humans, but we also have the resources to do it. And we've already shown what can be achieved. And this webinar will showcase some incredible success stories. But we know we need to do more. The UN has declared this as the decade for ecosystem restoration. And world leaders have, through the Glasgow Climate Pact, recognised the value of protecting and restoring nature in the fight against climate change. And this year, um, world leaders are also set to agree a new global framework for nature at the forthcoming summit of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And of course, the European Commission itself is set to propose its new nature restoration regulation on the 23rd of March. 
So this webinar is timely both to showcase what we've already done, but to challenge and inspire people to do more. So we're going to run the webinar really in two parts, two halves. First, we're going to be showcasing some of the amazing restoration projects that partners have been delivering and which we have profiled in a publication called The Rewards of Restoration. And second, we're going to have a panel conversation to debate, to debate our hopes and expectations of the new regulation and any implications, of course, arising from the war in Ukraine. To kick off proceedings, um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome David Thomas. Uh, he is the Programme Director of the Endangered Landscapes Programme of, of the Cambridge uh, Conservation Initiative. And David is a great friend to conservation and be well known to many of you, having had a distinguished career in conservation, both with BirdLife uh, and also now with CCI. He has a particular interest in local engagement and empowerment and links between nature conservation, human rights, equity, livelihoods and well-being. Over to you, David. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, everyone. So we all know that um, nature is important to economies and our well-being, but urban living has separated many of us from our sources of food, water, energy, and this has hidden the scale of our dependence on the natural world. But half of global GDP, some 40 trillion euros, is dependent on nature, and forests provide drinking water to one third of the world's largest cities. Peatland store nearly 30% of global soil carbon. And nature has cultural value too, and provides the conditions necessary for good physical and mental health, as well as emotional and spiritual well being. Yet, despite this, globally, approximately 30% of natural freshwater ecosystems have disappeared since 1970. Soil erosion and other forms of degradation are costing the world more than $6 trillion a year in lost food production and other ecosystem services. And Europe is part of this. Recent assessments by the European Environment Agency show that most protected species and habitats have a poor or bad conservation status. About 9% of bees, vital pollinators, are threatened with extinction within the EU. And almost 40% of bird species have a bad or poor status. To address these declines, we need measures not only focused on conservation, so protecting what bits of nature remain, but on landscape scale restoration that brings back nature, restores ecological processes, builds resilience to stresses like climate change, and that delivers benefits and services to the people that live in those landscapes. The Endangered Landscapes Programme, managed by the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, is working with incredible people to restore landscapes across Europe, from the Caledonian forests of the highlands of Scotland to the Iberian Montado, from the wetlands of the Danube Delta to the Mediterranean Sea around Turkey. And at this point, I also want to acknowledge the courage of our grantees and their partners working in our projects in Ukraine, in the Pelesi region, on the border with Belarus, and in the Danube Delta. So outcomes from all of these projects demonstrate that it's possible to reverse the degradation caused by past policies and practices of land, water, and marine management. The Rewards of Nature Restoration publication is a result of a collaboration between the Endangered Landscapes Programme, the European Secretariat of BirdLife International, which as you've heard is the world's largest nature conservation partnership, and the United Nations World Conservation Monitoring Centre, a world leader in biodiversity knowledge. So together we recognise the need to bring examples from our collective experience of both the possibility and the benefits of restoring nature to a wider audience, to bring the opportunities to the attention of communities, land managers and decision makers, and to inspire, inspire them to put in place effective policies and legislation, and of course, take the necessary action to restore Europe's nature. The facts and figures that I started with demonstrate that loss of habitat and wildlife from Europe is not a marginal issue. It is widespread and ongoing and affects all of us. I anticipate that the presentations you'll hear from some of the conservationists featured in the book will give you reasons for hope. But a scale up from these examples 
will require the right policies and legislation to be in place. So it's in this context that I welcome the EU's initiative to develop a nature restoration law and look forward to the discussion with the panel of experts, including the EU Commission, to hear how the law will be up to the task and provide an example to the world in this UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, and thanks also uh, to the Endangered Landscapes Programme, which has been fantastically um, catalytic in supporting so many projects across our continent. So we're now going to turn to the rewards of restoration stories that we profiled in our book. Uh, and in a minute, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, uh, Naima Crotty, who's going to be showing you around a virtual photo exhibition that we've created. And as David said, nature restoration is basically about restoring life. Restoring habitats provides the homes of, for animals and plants to flourish. And of course, this also provides life for our own species by providing those things that are essential to us. Clean water, a stable climate, prevention of flooding, uh, inspiration, and even solace, as we found, many of us found during lockdowns over the last couple of years. So we had hoped to produce a physical exhibition to profile these stories, but sadly that just wasn't possible. So instead, uh, we've created a virtual photo exhibition uh, for you to see what we're talking about today. So my colleague Naima is now going to share her screen uh, and hopefully explain to you how this all works. Naima. Are you there, Naima? Oh, hello, can you hear me? We can now, yeah. Naima, yeah, sorry, I had, a, <laughs> I had a little problem with my internet connection. No problem. So I'm going to share my screen and show you the exhibition that we that we did. Um, so as Martin said, we have to do it virtually because of COVID, but I just sent you a link on the chat and you can check it out whenever you want to. So you will enter this page and you will have two options. So either enter the exhibition and do it manually or start a guided tour. So if you click here, uh, you can walk around virtually and check our uh, exhibition. You can click on any picture you're interested in and you will have also information about the picture and the context. And the other option, as I said before, is to have a tour. So like that, uh, it will automatically go from one picture to another and you of course will have the option to check the information of each picture, uh, like I did before. So this exhibition is going to be free. Uh, it's a free exhibition that you can enter with a link and it will be available until March 2023. So I'll invite you to check it out and enjoy uh, the beauty of the interaction. Thank you. Naima, thank you so much. Where did you say you were going to put the link? Did you going to put it in the Q&A bar? Uh, we... I will put it on the chat. Ah, great. Okay, so people will be able to see it, they just won't be able to comment, is that correct? Yeah. Brilliant. Anyway, well look, thank you so much. Uh, and it's always nice to see how uh, our move to an online world has created um, innovations. Uh, and I would encourage you to spend some time uh, looking at the stories in the exhibition um, whenever you have a spare moment. Uh, but anyway, we th also thought it'd be useful to have two speakers who are, have been intimately involved in a couple of the stories that we've profiled uh, in our book. And the first one is um, Katrien uh, Veens, and she is the uh, coordinator of the Care Peat Project at Naturpunt, uh, which is the um, bird life partner in Belgium. Uh, she's currently in the field at the moment, but she really wanted to share her experience with all of you and so she has pre-recorded her presentation and she's going to outline the success of the Care Peak project and the incredible importance of restoring peatlands, building on what David said earlier. Uh, and I think she's also at the end going to perhaps lay a little bit of a challenge for the EU nature restoration laws. So uh, uh, you'll watch the presentation from Catrien and then come back to me. Over to you to show the film. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to Birdlight for inviting me today, and also to take Carepeat on board of your campaign on the rewards of nature restoration. Um, my name is Katrien Mans, and I am the overall manager of the project Carepeat. 
Uh, Carepeat is an interreg Northwest Europe funded project with the aim to restore the carbon storage capacity of peatlands. Uh, I work on behalf of the organization Natuurpunt. Uh, Natuurpunt is a nature organization that is based in Flanders, Belgium, and is responsible for the restoration and management of more than 20,000 hectares of nature reserves. So why restore peatlands? Well, healthy intact peatlands are very important carbon sinks. Uh, worldwide, they store about 30% of the carbon in the soil, although they occupy only 3% of the land surface. However, a lot of peatlands are degraded and turn from a carbon sink into a carbon source. This is because peatlands are very often drained to change the land used into forestry, agriculture and peat extraction, and by this make the land more productive. As a result, the carbon that has been stored in the peat soil for thousands of years is again released into the atmosphere. That's why peatlands and the restoration of peatlands plays a very important role in our battle against climate change. In the European Union, 50% of the peatlands are degraded and are emitting a huge amount of carbon. So restoring peatlands will be key to achieving the EU's aim of being carbon neutral by 2050. Actually, restoring peatlands, restoring degraded peatlands have so many benefits for nature, climate and society. Uh, they protect us from extreme weather conditions, from floods and droughts. They provide, provide clean air and drinking water. And also they provide a home for a lot of species, a typical flora and fauna that have come to adjust these unique ecosystems. But in the project CarePeat, we do focus on their role as for climate mitigation. Um, the main goal of our project is to reduce carbon emissions from peatlands and to restore the carbon storage capacity of the peatlands. Uh, to achieve that goal, we have three main objectives in the, the Care Peat project. Uh, firstly, we are demonstrating a range of restoration techniques that land managers can use to restore peatlands. And secondly, we are developing and applying reliable greenhouse gas measurement methods and predictive models, which will be made available for land managers as a user-friendly decision support tool. And third, we are feeding all this information from the measurements and the model into socio-economic business cases and policies to tackle the financial and political challenges that are ahead of us to scale up peatland restoration in Europe. But the project runs for about five years until 2023, um, so another two years to go, and holds a budget of about 7 million euros. Uh, CarePeat is 12 partners working together in five European countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Ireland and the UK. Um, basically, it is a partnership of researchers and nature managers working together, also with the umbrella organization Eurosite. And here you have a list of all the partners, so this may be of interest to you if you want to get in touch with CarePeat partners in your own country. So, of course, an impar important part of our project is, of course, the peatland restoration. And this is the heart of the project, so we are restoring nine pilot sites put for in total about 650 hectares. Um, we cover a wide range of peatland types from raised box to poor fence and different stages of degradation, including bare peat, so a farmer peat extraction site. Um, and the sites have one thing in common, and that is that hydrology, rewetting and controlling the water table is key to the restoration of the peatlands. So if I can highlight just one site, uh, the valley of the Zwarte Beek or Black, Black Creek in Belgium. Um, this is the most intact peatland in Flanders, um, and it is very much suffering from drainage. It is a poor iron rich pen drained for farming, mostly grazing, and is being restored as part of care peat. Um, the pilot site exists of several peatland sites along the river Black Creek um, for in total 250 hectares. And the aim is to restore the vegetation to quaking bog and transi transition mires. Uh, in 2020, Naturpen started closing 15 kilometers of ditches. And by spring and summer, the next year, we could already see the first positive results. 
as you can see in the pictures below. Uh, we could even welcome the first successful breeding pair of common crane for Belgium at the Valley of the Zwarte Beek, and this is an absolute highlight of our work there. So with the work we do in Kerpit, we also want to aim up, uh, so my apologies, we also aim to scale up um, peatland restoration in Europe. Therefore, we work on identifying socioeconomic business cases. Models that we are exploring are carbon credits and carbon farming. And we are also raising uh, political awareness and proposing new strategies to protect and restore peatlands to policymakers as well on national as European level. And our partner Eurosight is taking all this knowledge and ex expertise and is setting up both European and national platforms to secure the long-term benefits of the project. And of course, a strong European restoration law will be an important tool to, for scaling up peatlands restoration. Um, it can really strengthen the acknowledgement of peatlands in their importance for biodiversity and climate by European governments and provide the necessary funding to realize our goal of restoring the degraded peatlands of Europe. So that's, that's it for me. Um, I kindly invite you to follow our project through our social media or to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, in the next few weeks, we will be releasing several videos about our pilot sites. And as a teaser, I would like to share uh, with you the first footage. Thank you. If you have any questions, please contact me. You can find my details below. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic, Katrin. Uh, and on behalf of all of us, thank you for the work that you're doing uh, with that brilliant cross-border project. Um, really great to see and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more peat and restored over the coming years. Okay, our second speaker is um, Zafir uh, Kizilkaya who is the president of the Mediterranean Conservation Society and the manager of the Gakova Bay project. Um, and Zafi is going to be drawing on the success of that project and the vital importance of restoring marine ecosystems. Um, he also will probably say something about the future importance of legislation to drive restoration. Over to you, Zafir. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and talking about ecosystem restoration, especially in marine environment. I would like to share my screen. So I hope you all see the screen. So yes. this is an aerial small picture from Gyokova Bay marine protected areas. It looks fantastic because it's very well protected on the land side, but from air, it looks great. But what's happening underwater, nobody knows. All right, so here is the map of the Gyokova Bay. It's southwest corner of Turkey, and it's quite sizable, you know, marine protected areas, almost 1,100 kilometers square kilometers and 827 square kilometers of marine part. So why it is so important? Because it's the refugee for endangered species, mainly for Mediterranean monk seals, sandbar sharks, Mediterranean grouper, Mediterranean cup corals, and many other species. And we have, in the human side, we have over 100 fisher women. They are professional fishers 
going out to sea almost 300 days in a year, and they totally depended on fishing, small scale fishing in the area. So what happened in 2008, the fisheries totally collapsed. All the small scale fishers and especially women, they lost more than 65% of their income and they become really you know, desperate and in a panic because of this all illegal fishing activities, overfishing by trawlers and invasive species. This picture is a shot from small scale fishers and from this net, 272 fish came out, only one Mediterranean fish world. So the rest are all invasives and many of them are not consumable. Even if it's consumable, nobody wants to eat them because nobody knows them. So this is such a big problem. And I was the part of the scientific team in 2008 we did a lot of research in all the marine protected areas and non-protected areas of the northern Mediterranean coastlines. And fish biomass by itself is the sign of health in any reef in the world as a gram per square meter. So look at all those MPAs in the Mediterranean. The black stars are well-enforced no-take reserves. And the red stars are other MPAs, but without any enforcement. And Gyokova Bay, look at, at the rightest part of the graph is only four gram per square meter, the least fish in the entire Mediterranean. And the important part in this graph, I would like to emphasize the blue color that represents the apex predators, the big fishes within the MPA. As the MPA gets mature, this blue color, the percentage of big fishes within the fish biomass increases. So in Gyokova Bay, we didn't have any fish and we didn't almost any big fishes at all. And they're all covered with lost fishing gears, including long lines. So as a solution 2010, we convinced the local community, government and all the other related stakeholders establishing fully protected areas, like no fishing allowed at all in these red zones. These are all wetland, you know, the connected areas. There are a lot of nursery and spawning grounds. And another thing we ma managed, achieved, is the largest prohibited for trolling and persaining area in European Union and non-European Union. Now it is much larger. We extended this almost to here. 300 square kilometers of area, which is called highly protected. So what's happened next? All you can see this lost fishing long lines, no fish, no marine life. We cleaned them all. It, it was quite tedious and it was quite expensive. And just seven years later, exactly the same corner, exactly the same picture, same view, sponge colonies grow back. Endangered species came back. So, but the crucial part of this ecosystem restoration in marine environment, enforcement, enforcement and enforcement. We build up the enforcement system, local marine rangers who are ex-fishers. Now they became rangers in the area. They know all the illegal fishing resources and people or activities, and they became our you know, main enforcement team. And we had so many you know, dangerous situations you know, in the last 10 years, but finally we set it up. And now we have been monitoring the area and look at this one of no fishing zones, our fish biomass right now, even more than 100 gram per square meters, uh, per square meter. So that means in 10 years with good enforcement and look at the blue colors, all those apex predators, big fishes, are making up the fish biomass. So that means in 10 years of well-enforced, well-surveillance, well-monitored areas are coming back. This is one of our underwater monitoring cameras. These are sandbar sharks coming for breeding. And in the last 10 years, their sightings increased more than 500%. And right now we have a special software artificial intelligence special software monitoring the all those footage and telling us when you know how many sharks 
we have recorded. So these are also real-time cameras in our monk seal caves. So when we started the project, there are only two monk seals in the bay. Right now we have nine different monk seals, which is a big population for Turkey because we're talking about over 100 monk seals in Turkey and at least 10% of them in the project site. And this year we have one more pop. So these are infrared cameras, real-time cameras, continuous recording. These are not photo trap cameras. So also the same software monitors the, these footages and gives us Excel sheets at what time and how many monsters in which cave we recorded. So climate change monitoring is really important because from the satellites, you can get water temperature, surface temperature anywhere else in the world. But the most important part is the vertical. So every five meters down to 40 meters depth, we set up temperature loggers. Every minute they synchronizingly record the temperature and we download them at the end of the year. So the most important thing is this thermocline le level around 20 meters which is called and warm waters meets. And this is the sign of health. And because below all the, you know, sessile organisms, sponges, invertebrates, you know, uh, depends on cold water. Look at in 2015, it is around 22 meters. In 2016, it is around 30. In 2017, it is around 40. And it's going deeper and deeper. So we every year we record the increase of warm water temperatures going deeper and deeper in the summer season. So this is the proof of you know warming seas and climate change in the eastern Mediterranean and changing of habitats, which enables all the invasive species coming from Red Sea surviving range increased, breeding success increased. So after all those enforcement after all those fish biomass and monitoring, socioeconomic monitoring, the fishery cooperatives have been recording, told us that there's more than 400% increase in small scale fisheries income in Gyokova Bay. And the more important part is the size of the fishes. Before the fishes are only 10 to 15 centimeters. Right now we have, you know, three, four kilograms of mature adult fishes all around. So look at this is a fisher woman with her son came in from fishing. This is such a great catch for them. And this was just a dream before 10 years ago. And when we take a look at the graph, this number is showing amount of income per boat per month. So since 2013, there's a steady increase on the income. And last year's slowing down is just because of COVID related. The couple, like this two months, January and February is quite good. We are around 14, 15,000 Turkish Liras per boat. So that means the positive recovery of the ecosystem for fishers, small scale fishers are still going up. So this is the picture you saw with all those long lines and no habitat. But look at it right now, this is one of our monitoring cameras. So we have so many fish, including big predators. We even recorded 300 kilograms of bluefin tuna. This is the first record for Mediterranean MPAs that bluefin tuna is foraging within the MPA. So this is the picture I show you that fishing, you know, landing of the small scale fishers with 272 fish at that day. So we gave fishers forms. They have been recording the everyday's catch of invasives saying over a year, because we need those data, whether the stock is increasing or decreasing for each different species. Take a look at this lionfish catch just for a day is 25 kilogram of lionfish among all of them. So we decided to promote those eatable fishes to the restaurants. Luckily, famous chefs of the countries supported us. Right now, we are working with 64 fine dining restaurants. All the chefs have different you know, recipes for all those invasives. And just last year, we sold 2.2 tons of invasive species to consumer markets, mainly fine dining restaurants. 
And right now, over 500 kilometers of coastline, we are buying entire invasive species catch from the small scale fishers. And we are just selling them to the restaurants. And depending on the, the stock we will have at the end of this summer, we will start delivering fish to chain, cold chain, big markets. So the question is, what is gonna happen in the next 10 years? So Mediterranean MPAs right now covers only 6%. Turkish MPA, uh, 7%. Turkish MPA, 6% on the paper. Mediterranean no fishing zones, fully protected areas, 0.04%. And Turkish no fishing zones is only 007 and 85% of the fish stocks overfished in Mediterranean. And now we will talking about 30 by 30. And I don't feel, I don't think this is ambitious target. This is impossible. This is an imaginary target. We are just sitting in our, uh, in our chairs and we are just increasing the targets. 30% of lands and marine areas is going to be protected on the targets. Who will mandate this? Who will initiate these targets to be implemented in EU and non-EU countries? So this is a really important you know, movement right now in EU law, how we will regulate these targets. But the most important thing we are just facing every day, increasing fuel prices. Luckily, I'm saying luckily, almost bring the industrial fleet to stop in Turkish waters. That's a big issue in Turkey right now. But you probably know annually $35 billion are going as a subsidy to world fisheries and major share is coming from EU. Just stopping subsidizing fisheries will really enable us to reach these targets because subsidies to the fisheries will the main obstacle for any kind of marine ecosystem restoration. Because we stop industrial fishing in Gyokova Bay. I, I just witnessed one per seiner caught 22 tons of fish in Gyokova. This is more than five years of fish that six fishery cooperatives could make it in more than six years. So we have to stop industrial fishery at some level. And maybe we have to sacrifice eating fish not every day, maybe once you know, a week, maybe you know, once every two weeks, but we have to you know, start some restoration, just preventing the mistakes we have been done so far. Thank you, Martin. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Safran. Sorry to rush you at the end. It was the most inspirational story uh, to hear how you've delivered more sharks, more tuna, more seals, bigger fish, and of course, um, fish, fisheries income. So many, many congratulations to you. Um, I was keen to move on because we have a panel discussion now who um, in a sense are gonna reflect on the stories they've heard, but also think about the future. And unfortunately, one of our panelists has to leave on the hour. So um, let, me, let me welcome them to you now. Um, so we have um, Andrea Vittori, who's a member of the uh, Com Commissioner Sinky Vicious's cabinet. Uh, and he's in charge of the biodiversity and nature portfolio, including the nature restoration law. Uh, also like to introduce um, Jutta Paulus, who's a member of the European Hello. Parliament. Uh, and uh, she is also the shadow rapporteur for the Green Group on the nature restoration law. We have Summer Aikerman, an environmental activist uh, and clearly younger than many of us. Uh, and she actually is the co-author of the forward to our rewards of nature restoration book. We have Evelyn Underwood, who is the head of the program for biodiversity and ecosystems at the Institute for European Environment Policy. And we also have my colleague, Ariel Brunner, who is the senior head of policy for BirdLife Europe and Central Asia. Um, so really what we want to do now is move towards the future, talk a little bit about policy, a little bit about politics. And um, I'm gonna pose a question to each of the panelists in turn. Uh, they're gonna give brief answers and then we're going to open it out to all of you. And as I said right at the beginning, this is your chance to ask any questions that you like. Um, we'll be going probably for another uh, 50 minutes or so. So please put your questions in the Q&A button. 
uh, and then we'll turn we'll turn to your questions in a short while. But I'm going to start off with a question for Andrea, if I may. So, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement and anticipation about the new restoration law, uh, but there's also a little bit of concern. I suppose one of the concerns that we have is, you know, how will it actually drive change? We've seen other brilliant pieces of legislation like the Birds and Habitats Directors, which have done some great things, but perhaps still haven't fulfilled their potential. So give us confidence that this new law will actually drive transformational change. Andrea. Yes, thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you for, for the invitation to attend this uh, very good meeting and and thank you to those who presented before because they were really really inspiring uh, projects um, and and uh, and there are key lessons to be to be taken from from this uh, fantastic uh, project uh, well indeed as you said this is a major deliverable of the biodiversity strategy um, it was uh, the commitment to present this law was strongly supported by the european parliament um, and, uh, and also by member states in the council. Um, so, well, as, as you said, indeed, it's, you know, we, we had in the seventh Environment Action Programme and in the previous biodiversity strategy, a target to uh, achieve at least 15% uh, uh, of um, uh, restored uh, degraded ecosystems by 2020. Um, and halt biodiversity loss. Um, and and uh, the, the EU failed uh, on, on this, uh, not only because of the policy context, there are a number of, of issues uh, of reasons for that, but I think that um, this uh, proposal, uh, as usual, this will be a proposal that will have to be uh, then discussed uh, um, and approved by the co-legislators, um, intends to um, uh, tackle two uh, main, um, uh, at least two main uh, gaps that have been identified in policy making uh, to restore biodiversity. The first one uh, was that the, the, the target of 15% uh, of the graded ecosystem was very general. There was no definition of the graded ecosystems. So what we're looking for now is really to have a, a, a headline target but then have very much ecosystem specific targets and which are as, as precise as possible, depending on the availability of data, baseline monitoring systems in place and, and so on. Um, the second element uh, that, the, that, that was, uh, um, uh, let's say a cause of, of, uh, of uh, non achieving this, this objective was uh, the lack of a, a strong governance system. Um, with the with the proposal, we aim really to have um, a, a broad mobilization, uh, and we saw from the project that uh, we that were represented how it is important to have integrated uh, project and the mobilization and and the working with local uh, stakeholders, local authorities, farmers, fishermen, um, and the idea is really. Um, uh, to mobilize uh, all these um, resources in society with the scientists, with the public authorities to prepare for member states to prepare a very solid and ambitious uh, nature restoration plans with a very long term perspective. So it's not looking at, 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 the, at the, you know, at the deliverable for 2030. We know that it takes time for, for nature to recover. Um, so we will have a, a very long term perspective. And the idea is really also that it should um, help the strategic planning of uh, land use planning will be essential. We will have the climate and energy plans. Uh, we, we have the, the, the cap strategy plans. We have the operational plans for, for whatever is, is the funding support. But this will also help having really um, uh, this governance system in which then uh, the commission then can assess uh, and, and, um, and ensure that they are, they are solid. Um, and uh, the, the, their preparation will help uh, civil society, experts, scientists to get involved for that. And that's also very, very important for um, the achievement of, of uh, long-term results. So this is a little bit what, we, what we're working on, uh, what, what Commissioner Sikevich is, is very, very keen on. And this is, is one of, the, of his major deliverables and he's very, very keen on this. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. Um, we'll be coming back to you later, um, but I'm going to turn now to Jutta, who I know does need to leave in quarter of an hour. But um, Jutta, you, you've heard a lot from Andrea there about the ambition of the new law, about the targets, about the need for good governance. I wonder if you could offer your perspective on what you've heard and perhaps say a little bit about um, what you think needs to be the political strategy, really, to try and get the most ambitious law that we need. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, Andrea, for sharing with us what the Commission is thinking about. Of course, there has been a leak round already, as we all know, and um, I'm, I'm happy that you actually did take up quite a few of the demands which we, as, as the Greens Group in the European Parliament, formulated in our, in our paper on what we are would like to see in a nature restoration law. So we have mainly four key aspects. The first is a clear definition of restoration, because I think this is really um, adamant, because if you leave the doors open to for the member states to, to define what is restoration, what can be counted towards restoration, and what can be counted as full or half or whatever restoration, that would maybe lead to effects which one would not necessarily like to see. So I do agree that restoration is not equal to rewilding, right? So we have a lot of ecosystem, Annex 1 ecosystems, which um, have developed through human use. Like, for example, the, the famous um, Orchards, Streuobstwiesen, which are very species rich meadows with the with apple trees, cherry trees, whatever, where a, a, a a wealth of biodiversity has developed and which will never survive without um, without human management of these of these areas. So restoration is not equal to rewilding. That's clear. But we think that the Commission should really be in the driver's seat when it comes to definition. What can be counted as restoration? Are we giving member states a bit of free reign? For example, saying, okay, if you um, rejuvenate, that's a beautiful term which I learned from, a, from an Irish activist who said we are not, no longer talking about re-wetting peatland, we are talking about rejuvenating peatland, which is much nicer. Um, so if you rejuvenate the peatland, but allow, for example, for harvesting of reed and other plants that grow there, of course, that's not a full restoration, but it could be a way to um, improve the situation as it is while still giving the farmer whose family has maybe farmed this land for decades or centuries, give him still a possibility to use the land because um, people are will not be happy being just rewarded for doing nothing. They want to do what, what they like to do, what their profession is. So we need a clear definition. Then you already said it, we need ambitious and binding targets. And we are very happy that you also took up the uh, idea of having ecosystem specific targets, especially on peatlands. We just heard in that wonderful presentation how important peatlands are and they have become sort of a hobby horse of mine in the last two years because um, I'm also working on climate issue but also on biodiversity and peatlands are just our partners in climate change mitigation adaptation and of course against biodiversity loss. So we need ambitious and binding targets. Um, we need supporting measures and we need financing. And I think financing is already, could already be done through the LIFE um, program, of course, but we do believe that it might not be enough money in there to, to be able to support member states in restoration, especially the member states which are not as economically strong as my home, home country, Germany, is. So this might be a bit difficult. And I'm really looking forward to the Commission um, proposal, um, especially when it comes to how will you ensure, as you said, governance, the assessment of the plans of the member state, because we have very good legislation looking at the Natura 2000 network, Habitats Directive, Birds Directive, but enforcement is actually the problem here. I mean, you know yourself how many infringement procedures are are out there and we also believe that it could be in, that the approach to to have a broad public participation to take the local population on board to take 
also local businesses on board, especially, of course, the farmers who always are afraid that they might lose land which they urgently need for their, their income. So I think the participation, go there first, talk to people first, and then decide which measures could be done appropriately and how could they be funded. That, of course, is key to the, to the, um, to the success of this law, the actual implementation of the, on the ground. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thanks, Jutta. And uh, just to repeat what Zafir said earlier, really, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. Um, it's obviously a really key element to any regulation. Um, Jutta, if you have to run at three, you know, thank you so much, but I will just, we'll, um, we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. I'm going to turn now to Summer. Oh, I have five minutes. <laughs> oh, I have five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just uh, turn to Summer now. So, you know, Summer, you know, you are, you know, your generation is inheriting, uh, I suppose the you know the, the planetary challenge that um, we're creating, and just really any reflections that you have about the your hopes and fears about the new law. Over to you, Summer. Hello, um, thank you for inviting me here, um, and I want to say thanks to some of you for the great work that you're doing on nature restoration. I've had the pleasure to work alongside some of you. Um, very hardworking people on this panel before. Uh, that's kind of where my positive ends. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna be all activisty here. Um, so I hope you listen. <laughs> so I've kind of been born into a generation of lost people. One that is searching for answers about how to fix what I've been born into. Um, I hope that the generations after me do not have to have the same worries as I, scared that those after them or not have to deal with the destruction made by others. Um, I would like my generation to be that of restoration, solutions, mitigation, but it shouldn't have to be this way. Growing up, I was taught about nature and biodiversity in school, but not really, like I knew what the word meant, but I didn't know anything about forests or oceans or farmlands or anything like that. So when I discovered that the world around me was being destroyed, it was very hard to engage with it because I wasn't sure what was being destroyed or how to fix it. One headline that's really stuck with me in my mind for the past several years is, world fails to meet a single target to stop the destruction of nature. That made me feel like all hope was lost. What is the point of setting targets and percentages if it feels like no effort is being made to meet them? I'm going to relate what I have to say to forests, even though I'm probably not more known for talking about agriculture. Uh, forests are a love of mine and talking about forest protection is a great way to restore them. Their carbon sinks, their ecosystems, peatlands, etc. cetera. Um, in Finland, I do forest inventories. My favorite lichen is called Noyantovi Akala. Um, it's threatened, it's an threatened species. It's under threat from the decline of old growth forests and decaying wood. How does one restore that? I don't know. The, place, the pace of felling in Finland in recent years means that 1% of the most diverse forests are felled each year. One in nine species are threatened in Finland and it has taken Finland almost 30 years to restore roughly 30,000 hectares of forest. Yet more than 20,000 hectares of most valuable forest were cleared or planned to be felled in 2020 alone. How can nature be restored if policies are inconsistent? How can nature be restored if one thing is said and then another thing is done? Finland has failed to uh, reach a single <laughs> target of biodiversity loss by 2020 and now the aim is the biodiversity strategy which is to halt the loss of biodiversity and turn the trend towards 2030. I'm relating this all to Finland because I live here and it's familiar to me, but this applies to all the EU. I just can't believe that meeting any target set is possible, given the track record we have. It's, it's not just that these policies are inconsistent, it's also the greed of companies that are supported by governments, parliament, commission. Last week, the Finnish state-owned forest company reported that they made 120 million euros in profit last year by felling forests. And they reported that they invested millions back into biodiversity. But would it not make more sense to just stop the destruction of nature so there wouldn't be a huge demand for restoration? 
Should restoring nature or doing any positive act for climate or biodiversity be rewarded at this point? Not destroying the planet is kind of the bare minimum. Why should those impacted have to congratulate world leaders for simply causing less destruction than the year before, which we have yet to see? Hope and inspiration are good. That is what helps people not feel the constant pang of dread in our hearts as a result of the dire situation we're in. Hope will not restore our peatlands, our wetlands, our waters, our coral reefs, our forests, our soils. The only thing that can be done is actually taking action and make good policies. <laughs> the, I'm gonna relate it back to the IPCC latest report that came out on Monday. And I'm going to reference a few lines from it. And every time I say human society, I want you to replace that in your head with EU policy. Human society causes climate change. Climate change through hazards, exposure, and vulnerability generates impacts and risks that can surpass limits to adaptation and results in losses and damages. Human society can adapt to, maladapt, and mitigate climate change. Ecosystems can adapt and mitigate within limits. Ecosystems and their biodiversity provisions, livelihoods, and ecosystem services. Human society impacts ecosystems and can restore them and conserve them. I'm really sorry from what I'm about to say, but I'm just kind of tired of events and panels like these that allow the EU Commission to greenwash us further when they're the reason that the EU is in this mess in the first place. So I hope that you do better, make better policies, because you only have yourselves to blame. Thank you. Uh, some of that is an enormous gauntlet that you've laid down, but we have the responsibility to pick it up. Um, thank you for being direct and clear, as always. Um, Evelyn, Summer was talking about the latest report in the IPCC about the value of nature as well. Uh, and I know you've done a specific bit of work looking at, I suppose, the carbon benefits of restoring um, uh, sites, habitats protected under the EU directives. Could you just say, um, perhaps quite specifically, how you think the restoration law can deliver for climate, um, both in terms of mitigation, but any reflections on adaptation as well. So in a sense, to, cap, to basically try to articulate the prize and why it's worth it. Thank you, yes. We did in our study uh, look at the potentially big um, synergies for um, biodiversity conservation and, and climate. Um, through the restoration of Annex 1 habitats. So um, I'll point out some key messages, um, but I would actually like to also take the opportunity to point out a few limitations of what we did, because there has been some misunderstanding. So in the study, what we did is we looked at the evidence that's available to um, prioritise or rank Annex 1 habitats for their importance to carbon. And we looked at how much carbon there would be in the Annex 1 habitats if they were all fully restored or in good condition. So the number that we came up with of 80 million tonnes of carbon per annum, which is a huge figure if you look at the Lulu CF target, is a theoretical number that would be the case if all Annex 1 habitats were fully restored. Now we know that the realities of restoration are not that. Um, real, some habitats can never be restored. Some habitats will um, can be restored, but climate change will work against that. And some habitats could be restored, but the socioeconomic consequences of that um, would require some compromises. So this is really an exploration of the potential. What we did come up with was um, another estimate of the, um, the carbon stock that would be in those habitats, and that's, of course, a great deal larger. So I think we've heard a lot about the, um, the potential synergies of um, peatland and west wetland restoration. And of course, there are the marine habitats as well, which we were unable to look at because we didn't have the evidence base available, which also points to the need for um, this upscaling of monitoring of uh, data availability and 
on that point, I'd like to say on the nature restoration law that, of course, at IEP, we very much welcome this uh, proposal. Um, the potential that it has to strengthen the impact of the EU nature directives by, of course, setting targets and timelines, unlike the directives have, um, and going beyond, for example, for pollinators and the potential um, powerful synergies for the well, water, marine, climate adaptation. Um, we, um, we see a key challenge when the proposal is published um, to persuade member states that this is really um, something that will bring them benefits that will outweigh the potential costs. We can see um, a, a vision where um, some member state governments will um, gasp at the idea that they need to go beyond Natura 2000 when they're already failing to define conservation measures, protect and manage their Natura 2000 sites, um, whilst failing to see the synergies that they can gain um, by looking at all the other benefits that would come from this type of restoration. And the challenge will also be similar to the um, attempts at any other um, strategic planning in that it will require um, government to talk to each other. So the environment ministry will need to go to the ministry that's responsible for climate adaptation. There will need to be a dialogue with uh, infrastructure planning. And for these nature restoration plans to work, for this governance to work, it will, um, it will require this, this strong governance process. And we would want to see an emphasis on the prioritized action frameworks as being a tool that should be at the basis of this process as well. Um, so in all, um, we, um, will work, we welcome the publication of this proposal and we will be ready with evidence of the economic and social benefits of restoration and the costs of inaction um, to uh, contribute to the political dialogue at the next months in response to this proposal. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Evelyn. Um, and, you know, maybe if you have time to put in the chat box, the link to your report, because I think people would like to read it if they have not yet done so. Um, I'm just going to ask my final question to the final panellists, um, my colleague Ariel. Now, Ariel, you've been around EU policy for a couple of decades or so, and you've seen what works and what doesn't work. So perhaps I'd like you to sort of reflect on what you've heard from all the panelists here now, a mixture of both, you know, what's been proposed, perhaps some of the skepticism, some of the benefits, which Eden's just outlined, and perhaps also in your remarks, reflect on how um, seismic some of the policy landscape has been shifting um, as a result of the war in Ukraine. So general reflections, and then maybe saying what the new implications are, Ariel. Thank you. That's, that's quite a lot to throw on the fire, but um, yes, the EU has a track record of passing good legislation. Just think about the Birds and Habitats Directive. It has a quite poor track record with getting that, that legislation enforced. Uh, and uh, legislation gets eventually enforced, but until now, it tends to take anything between 20 and 40 years. And the problem is that we don't have that time anymore. So I think that the big challenge for the restoration law is can we can it be a law that actually gets enforced and leads to real restoration on the ground now not when it's too late and from that point of view i think the com from what we know about what the commission is doing there is quite a lot there that goes in that direction the fact that it's a regulation the fact that there are quantifiable targets but uh, our judgment ultimately on the legislation uh, will be based on a fairly simple measurement, which is, will you in 2024 be able to take countries to the ECJ because they have not done their job? If the answer is yes, it's a good law. If the answer is no, it's a pointless law. Uh, it's a bit brutal. And of course, we hope that all countries will embrace and do what they but the experience is, is, is what it is. And I'm afraid that what we have seen, and I think that's maybe some of uh, Sommer's criticism, we've seen a sea change in the EU 
under the current commission. Uh, we have moved really, uh, we turned a corner from a state of denial where we've spent a lot of time saying the problems are not there, the economy comes first and so on, to actually saying, yes, the problems are there and we need to solve it, but I'm afraid that we've ended mainly an era of greenwashing. If you look at what has been happening on a lot of the dossiers in recent years, we are seeing a lot of things that sound wonderful on the headline, but are then completely being emptied uh, by the vested interests when you look at the details. Unfortunately, in some cases, this emptying is already being done inside the commission. In many cases, it's the, it's the uh, governments in council and often also the parliament that are participating to it. This must not happen again. So we need measures that are not fakeable. And that's where we still have uh, worries. And I think Utah uh, pointed correctly about what will count as restoration, because for example, a headline target of 20% sounds fantastic. If you allow member states to count their existing and usually failing agri-environmental schemes as restoration, then the job is already done. Every single country in Europe has already met the target and it's all hunky-dory, but it's not going to do any good to anyone. Um, so that's in terms of what we expect and where the, 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 the hopes and the fears are. In terms of the politics, um, I really hope that we can together um, create a, a, a groundswell behind this law um, because this law is just vitally needed. If we want to survive as a society, there are a few things that we need to do. One of them is getting rid of fossil fuels. The other one is getting rid of war and violence and conserve an open society. The third one is bringing back nature. We won't survive without it. It's that important. It's up there. Now, it's also crucial that we provide an example to the world. So this restoration law can avoid, you know, Belgian cities being swept away by floods as happened uh, last summer, but it can also give a wider hope to the world because if we, in the most degraded uh, uh, region of the world, that is also the richest one and the one where people have the most resources, if we cannot start inverting the destruction of nature, then what do we want to tell to other parts of the world that have you know, huge problems uh, of feeding their people, of basic governance and so on. So it's really important and I think we should be uh, excited about it. The last thing I want to say is that it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because uh, it's all fine and good, but uh, there will be, people who do not want this to happen, namely the intensive farm lobby, the fishing lobby, and the forestry lobby. They do not want restoration. And we have seen it again and again. I mean, you know, fishing lobby, despite what we have seen from Gokova Bay, which made absolute perfect sense, the European Parliament has just voted to give those subsidies, not just to the big industrial players that are destroying the sea, but even to the criminals that have been caught uh, fishing illegally. So that's what we are up against. And they are going to misuse the food security argument. They have already launched a massive offensive against the farm to fork um, strategy, cynically exploiting the, the war in Ukraine and the upcoming spike in cereal prices. Today, there has been a response to it from 85 civil society organizations. So I certainly hope that the commission will uh, keep its cool head and focus on real food security. Real food security means on the short term, ensuring that we stop wasting food on things like biofuels and that we deliver food to the really vulnerable populations that need it. But on the medium, and it's a very short medium term, Food security is about bringing our ecosystems back to health. And in many cases, this means a U-turn on the way we produce food, whether it's intensive agriculture or intensive uh, fisheries. And it's a, this is a bullet that we need to bite. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. And thank you all of you for giving your opening comments. Um, we've got about a quarter of an hour um, for this uh, chat. and 
there's been some questions coming through. There seems to be two main themes, one around will the nature restoration law force a little bit of a rethink of the cap, and Ariel's made a little reference to that. And the other one really is about financing. Um, and there was a specific question there is about, um, you know, how can we avoid the same problems that we had elsewhere where we didn't mobilize sufficient resources, for example, to implement the Habitats Directive? Um, so how can we attract additional money? So, but I think just out of politeness, really, Andrea, um, really a chance for you to offer any reflections on what you've heard in general, and then perhaps either to address either the, the cap issue or indeed the financing issue. Andrea, and then if, if time permits, we'll go elsewhere. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Very, very briefly. Um, and uh, and indeed, uh, I think uh, that Summer pointed out clearly that the issue of policy coherence is really the, 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 the crucial one and the most difficult to tackle, frankly. I think, uh, I think Ariel uh, recognized uh, that the effort of this current commission with the Green Deal was precisely that one, to try to put as much as possible policy coherence, which is the only way to achieve uh, synergies, ad address trade-offs, and, and have effectiveness of, of action. Um, I, and clearly there's a long way to go still, but, but uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very relevant step in the right direction. Another key element is, is enforcement um, and working with uh, landowners. I think uh, Mrs. Paulos mentioned this. Um, in fact, most of the land in the, in the EU is privately owned. Uh, uh, the forest, uh, the majority of forests are privately owned. Uh, uh, farmers, most of the farmers uh, own their land. So it's, um, it's, we need to work with them because it's, it's a private property, so we, we need to engage them. And I think that this project um, showed how this is possible, how it is possible to, to involve them and so on. And the same goes for, I saw in the question on, uh, for, for the industrial sector. Um, and for that, we need to work with local authorities. Our local authorities who take decision on land use planning, land use changes, um, and, and give permits. So again, uh, this idea of having these plans for the long term will help to bring everybody around the table. Um, on the funding, um, well, on the cap is, is very easy. Uh, the, the current cap is, will start uh, in, in January next uh, year, the, the, the new cap. Um, and if uh, this legislation uh, uh, come into force in, in a few years time, um, it will be a key element that the, the future cap uh, plans, uh, strategic plans will, will take into account. In the current one, uh, we have to work on the basis of uh, the legal basis that was agreed between the Parliament and the Council um, uh, in, uh, in uh, last year. Uh, for the funding, I think uh, there are two um, elements uh, that give a little bit of, um, of hope. Uh, one is that uh, between the Parliament and the Council, there's been a commitment uh, to dedicate at least 7.5% uh, of the whole uh, multi-annual financial framework, so the budget of the EU uh, for biodiversity in 2024, and raise it to 10% in 2026. So there is uh, quite a lot of potential of funding for that. The second element that uh, makes me a little bit optimistic is that uh, we're, our intention is uh, uh, to ask a member state in the national restoration plans to indicate how they are going to fund all these measures. So it's not only commitment uh, out of the blue, they will have also to plan the appropriate funding for this. So this will entail a discussion within each government on the funding available, on the resources, private and public funding. Um, I think that, that uh, the, the example you presented uh, provided also um, a reason for hope for, for private schemes uh, like the carbon farming uh, or, or payment for ecosystem services um, the EU has been uh, quite forthcoming with, with, a, with a taxonomy. We're seeing there's a, a much stronger interest. Nothing is perfect, of course, but uh, a much stronger interest from the uh, private sector to uh, support uh, the, the transition and uh, nature restoration. So I think that uh, on these elements, at least uh, there are uh, the conditions to make uh, this uh, law uh, success. And, and, uh, and, but we need the participation of everybody. It will not be, uh, you know, I always say that uh, the, the EU provides the framework, but the action uh, takes place on the ground as we saw it.
thank you yeah thanks andrea that's that's really really key um summer i'm going to put you on the spot there i mean and, and andrea rightly described the cap relationship between the cap process and the nature restoration law essentially there's obviously a lag in the system so you know the, the next cap potentially influenced by the nature restoration law i mean i know you have particularly strong views about agriculture quite rightly so i just wonder if you've got any any follow-up questions about how you would like to see policy evolve um that's a good question actually <laughs> thank you um so i would like to point back to the assessment that um bird life made actually with eeb i think um, about the national cap strategic plans and the assessment scored 18 out of 23 strategic plans as either poor or very poor across the explored dimensions of nature, protection of grasslands, peatlands, wetlands, money for biodiversity protection, climate action, harmful subsidies, and the involvement of NGOs. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that the time the last cap was around, similar events like this were had where the commission could say, we're doing our best. We're going to implement great policies about nature protection and restoration. So I'm going to ask, what is different this time? How can we know that it's not just the repeat of last time where we see poor results again? Evelyn or Ariel, do you want to pick up um, any of the themes that's come through? Is that Evelyn's hand up? Do you want to come up, Evelyn? Evelyn, did you want to come in? Thank you. Um, I see that the um, the main uh, elements of hope in this proposal are the legally binding reporting indicators and monitoring commitments, but that will require a huge effort because even with the nature directives, there's a certain consensus on what it means to report favourable conservation status, but uh, that was a result of quite a long dialogue. So. Um, so there we would really welcome the, 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 um, the efforts that will need to be put into this and particularly, for example, um, getting solid um, indicators and monitoring of soil status, the rollout of the EU pollinator monitoring scheme. These are things that uh, member states will then need to be, report on and that they can be, um, can be measured on. Um, we also um, would welcome references to the um, existing biodiversity indicators that we have at the EU level. So we have the farmland bird index, we have grassland, but, grassland butterflies index, we have a rollout of the, like I said, the butterfly and pollinator monitoring schemes uh, and various other possibilities. So that's where I see uh, a lot of the advances coming. Over to Ariel. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I mean, uh, whether this law will be more enforceable or, or faster in enforceable than the previous one hangs on the clarity and the water tightness of um, both the, uh, the targets and the governance, including things like, for example, um, the references to access to justice, because uh, a good law is not just one where uh, the commission can take countries to court um, if it has the time and the manpower and so on, but one where we can directly go to national court and challenge authorities when uh, they are violating their own, uh, their own legislation. Um, but I want to touch on three things that have been mentioned. So one is the incentives to landowners. Um, I think we all agree on it. The problem is that at the moment we are giving the wrong incentives. Uh, the money is there. I mean, farmers are a heavily, heavily, heavily subsidized sector. It's that we are subsidizing the wrong farmers to do the wrong things. Fisheries are bathing in subsidies. The problem is that they are not going to roll out things like Bokova Bay. They are going out to renew and buy even bigger and more modern boats that can scoop up the life out of the sea and drive into misery the, 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 the small fishermen. So 
the problem is not one per se of lack of resources, is how do we shift those resources? And on that, we know the sad story of the CAP, we know the sad story of the uh, EMFF and so on and so forth, and we are still not doing it there. Um, but a couple of things I would want to throw back to, uh, to Andrea, because we have the commission here, although I think that, again, the big problem at the moment is the member states and the parliament, and that's where uh, we will try to mobilize people. And I hope that <laughs> Somers and others will help us mobilize people. One is on uh, the ring fencing. It is true that we will be are supposed to spend seven and a half and then ten percent for uh, biodiversity, but this is only good if you measure it honestly. Now the Commission has a dreadful track record of cooking the books on climate tracking and on biodiversity tracking. Not just I say it; the European Court of Auditors says it. When the European Court of Auditors looked at climate spending, they couldn't find an, almost any of that climate spending that was actually doing something good for the climate. The Commission is now working on a new tracking methodology that needs to be honest, because if we are counting irrigation expansion and subsidies for pig farms as biodiversity spending, we can spend 10% of the budget, we can spend 100% of the budget, things will only go worse. And the other thing is, you've mentioned the taxonomy. This is a little bit of a provocation. The taxonomy was supposed to be an anti-greenwashing tool where the commission would put a science-based system so that private investors can know what is good for the planet. You know what happened with it. The commission has already declared that pretty much any logging, including that logging that destroys the forests that uh, Somers was complaining about, it will all be now considered as a significant contribution to climate change and doing no significant harm to biodiversity, which is shameful and fake. Um, then, <laughs> very, very recently, we lost the argument inside the commission, probably you also lost the argument, about the commission uh, telling the private sector that building new pipelines of gas to Russia was a good thing for the climate. Again, good for the climate and doing no harm to biodiversity. Maybe now people will rethink the wisdom of that. So the commission has already made itself complicit to greenwashing and to misleading publicity vis-a-vis -vis the sustainable uh, investment um, community. Now we'll see what will come with the next big batch of criteria, including the criteria on biodiversity. Now I'm sitting on a commission expert group, so I cannot say anything about the monkey business that is happening within the group, but I am certainly imploring the commission not to do the same things again, because at the moment, we are allowing people to destroy nature, we are subsidizing people to destroy nature, and now we are even labeling the destruction of nature as nature restoration. And that doesn't take us anywhere nice. Thanks. Um, Andrea, you know, inevitably with these sort of panels, it is you, the European Commission rep, who's going to be in the firing line for these things. Um, just, just Two things really. Firstly, we've had a question um, from uh, Claudio uh, in the chat box just to confirm that the proposal will come out on the 23rd. Um, and then the second thing, if there's any final reflections you want to offer to give us all confidence that we are going to be getting it right this time, that we are going to be meeting the sort of the challenge in terms of time, in terms of driving delivery. So just confirm the dates and then perhaps any final reflections from you. Thank you, Martin. Yes, indeed. Uh, um, uh, for the moment, it's, it's planned for the 23rd, and I don't have any indication that uh, this will not happen. Um, we're working very hard to, to deliver on that day. Um, and uh, just a general reflection, uh, of course, <clears throat> I, I see also in the chat uh, that uh, can the Commission oblige local levels of administration and so on. The point is that, you know, the commission doesn't have inspector, the commission doesn't have a police, the commission cannot oblige. The only thing is, is try to uh, help uh, and support member states uh, in implementing the legislation correctly. And uh, if this does not happen, uh, take them to, to the court. So the, the point is really trying to build the partnership, uh, try to orientate the incentives in a certain way. It cannot happen from one day to another. Um, I think uh, 
we know it. Um, I know that taxonomy is, is not perfect, but before we, we didn't have anything like it. There was not even a debate that we should direct, uh, you know, the big funding, the financial market into something like this. It was probably only the environmental NGOs who were saying, uh, you know, move away from fossil fuels and, and, and go, go to nature. We having report of the Banque de France, uh, central banks assessing the impact of biodiversity on financial outset. This was not happening before the commission didn't put on the table the issue of a sustainable finance and a taxonomy and, 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 and really uh, led, uh, led the debate. Uh, nothing is perfect and, and nothing will happen from one to another. So for me, really the call is, is let's work together. Uh, the CAP uh, gave, uh, you know, it was a choice of uh, the, the, the member state and, and of the member of the European Parliament, the elected, uh, that, that's democracy. They decided to, to lower the ambition uh, the, compared to the original one of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the Juncker Commission. Um, they, they, were, they were opposing linking to the, to the uh, targets and the uh, ambition of the Green Deal. <clears throat> but that's, that's democracy. And uh, the member state now had to prepare the, the start, uh, CAP strategy plans. Again, okay. these are our, our, our government. Uh, they, they have their, their, their uh, how to say, the, their methods, their process on how to do it. Uh, they, they are part of the government. Uh, there are the rules. So again, the, the commission can try to shape, influence, incentivize, uh, uh, but, but again, this is a responsibility of, of the national governments to, to prepare the plans. Uh, and and uh, this is why for me is really the partnership. And, and I think that the role of civil society in showing together with farmers, together with, with other um, economic stakeholders and foresters, saying that a different way, a different way of, of uh, doing business is possible. It's not only uh, about uh, rewilding and bringing everybody uh, out of business, it, it's really, really important. So again, for me, is is a plea to uh, try to work together, bring examples, uh, share expense, examples on how things can work and can be successful. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. And um, I'm going to close, close um, call it to a close there. And because I think, in a sense, what you've said at the end is really the justification for why we put on this event and why we collated all the stories that we did of. Um, you know, different organisations working with local communities to try and restore nature because of the huge prize that that gives both for wildlife, but also for us as human beings. So look, a, a massive thank you to David, uh, to a brilliant presentation from Katrine and Zafir, from uh, to, to Summer, to Evelyn, to Ari, and of course, Yuta, who's sadly not been, who had to leave a little bit earlier. And it's pretty clear that um, everyone, no doubt, on this call wants um, the nature, nature restoration law to be as effective as possible. Uh, we need it to be as effective as possible. Uh, and uh, you've outlined, Andrea, what we're hoping to, which we may see on the 23rd of March, and you've heard from us perhaps what we think the absolute conditions need to be in place to make it work. No doubt the um, conversations will continue, the NGOs and civil society will do what we can to exert pressure to get the best outcome, both at a commission level, but also parliamentary level and within member states. Uh, and um, we're also gonna carry on doing what we do best, which is to put nature back in the landscapes, in the marine environment, in freshwater environments, uh, because actually we know how to do it. Uh, and I think that should give us all confidence and hopefully even you, Summer, some hope that we can make things better over the next few years. And um, if you ever need a dose of optimism, then go back to the exhibition to have a little look around. You've seen the link in the chat box. Um, please do let us know if you'd like to see a hard copy of the book. Uh, and of course, if you have any final reflections, what else you think we need to be doing, either as civil society, as members of the commission or politicians, please do let us know. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say thanks very much and um, goodbye. <laughs>